ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがと
about eight minutes for each of them, each of you, for, to present your standpoint. And then after that, we'd like to discuss, a uh, general discussion is followed. And the general discussion is about how do we move forward in order to solve these energy issues, possibly by collaboration between the different disciplines and the different stakeholders. So I'd like to invite uh, so, uh, no, Janet Nikoro-san for, for the first presenter. So please go ahead. Okay. Uh, I believe you can hear me. I can hear you. And also please uh, share, share your slide, slide by sharing. Ah, ah, here we go. Okay. And uh, enlarge your screen. Okay. Is this okay? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Jicho Sensei. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. So I would like to start this discussion by bringing in the, an overview of an engineering viewpoint on the decarbonization process of the energy sector. And more specifically, my research deals with the role of heat pump technologies uh, in the roadmap towards carbon neutrality, and especially those heat pumps such as air conditioners that are related to space cooling and heating uh, for realizing thermal comfort in the build environment. In uh, simplified terms, we could say that a uh, heat pump is a device that is able to make heat flow from a lower temperature to a higher temperature, meaning that we would be able to cool down a space to a lower temperature or heat up a space to a higher temperature than a certain environment, such as the external environment. In the same way as uh, a hydraulic heat pump uh, that you might be more familiar with, we have that this kind of flow would not happen in practice, or uh, I mean, in naturally, so we would need some energy expenditure for making this happen. And uh, in the case of heat pumps, this uh, process is based on what is called inverse Carnot cycle, that for those who have a fresh thermodynamic background might know that leads to the maximum theoretical efficiency for this process or the minimum energy expenditure to realize a certain thermal process, so heating or cooling. Um, so if we want to give a numerical example for this uh, theoretical limit, we could take a space at 40 degree, heating up from an external environment of five degree, maximum efficiency would be something around nine, COP of nine, which means that whatever you give in to this device, as an energy expenditure, you would get nine times higher effect as a heat uh, heating effect. But this is a theoretical limit. So we engineer, we're trying to approach this limit in practice. And this, I believe, is a very beautiful and unachievable challenge that we deal with every day. So if we look instead at technological roadmaps or any uh, prospective scenario in the, the carbonization process, we would always uh, come uh, to uh, interface heat pumps as a key technology in those roadmaps. So this is because heat pumps can be applied to several different technological processes, such as air conditioning, air refrigeration, water heating, or steam generation. And they're forecasted to, um, to lead to a great deal of CO2 emission reduction, more than one gigaton by 2050. If we look at the breakdown of this uh, beneficial effect, we would see that heat pumps uh, directed to space cooling and heating are those accounting for the largest beneficial effect. So part of the reason for this is related to the steadily increasing demand for uh, um, systems that deal manage thermal comfort in indoor space. And uh, this technology, heat pump, has been undergoing as more than a century old development, <clears throat> and therefore it is recognized as a highly reliable and highly efficient alternative to traditional te technologies for uh, this purpose. So they're extensively applied worldwide, <clears throat> where we can see that at present we have about two billion units spread uh, worldwide, and they're forecasted to triple by uh, 2050. 
So by this first uh, statement, it might seem that I want to introduce a success engineering development story, but what I would like to talk about today is more like uh, the shortcomings of our uh, work as engineers in this field. But uh, yeah, this le will lead also to some opportunities. So um, heat pumps for space heating and cooling are the most extensively implemented worldwide and also among different heat pumps, the most energy intensive. Uh, they are responding to an extensive demand and they were uh, somehow um, implemented with an unregulated uh, manner and they came to be the largest uh, source of energy expenditure inside the building uh, sector. So what is more curious and representative of the shortcomings of this field is that we came to use them so extensively without actually knowing what is their actual performance, so how they actually uh, perform in practice. So the viewpoint I would like to bring today is that it, it is a very efficient uh, technology, but it is yet to be established if this technology will play the role of one of the main solutions or it might even become one of the main obstacles towards uh, the path toward global um, decarbonization of this field. So the inverse Carnot cycle and the fundamental process of heat pumps might seem simple, but what happens in reality is a bit more complicated. If we look at the air conditioner, we uh, would observe that this system have a control uh, method that is electronically driven, trying to meet thermal comfort condition while interacting with what is happening inside the room. Uh, so load scenario with external climate and different way of using these uh, uh, systems in regards to user dependent uh, comfort requirements. So we have that while responding to these disturbances, the system responds by supplying some cooling or heating effect and the real time difference between this cooling effect and the load in the room or the load demand produces a change in the room condition. So we can also say that what is happening inside the system is actually even more complicated than what is happening outside. And it's very difficult to represent statistically the performance of these systems because they're applied in many different uh, application cases, different climates, different uh, lifestyles, and they're used accordingly in very different ways. So due to this um, dynamic complexity, it, it results that the actual performance of this system is very different from what I uh, called before Car Invents Carnot cycle. But even more importantly, the, their performance is different from what is written on the catalog of the manufacturer. So we actually don't know their performance due to this dynamic complexity. And we need to know this, need to develop this uh, knowledge to drive this system efficiently. So in fact, if we were able to control efficiently this system during this dynamic uh, operation, we would be able to integrate them in uh, energy uh, management system able to make optimal choices for control and also for uh, supply of energy, um, which means uh, to bring this system through the fourth or cyber industrial revolution that is uh, being under, so it's undergoing in different fields such as electronics, where systems are able to acquire data and uh, share data with other interconnected systems. So, even though this technology is um, more uh, dated than other more recent and advanced technology, we still are not able to realize this kind of development because of three main challenges that we're facing now. The first is the lack of theoretical understanding of what is happening inside this system. And then the incomplete understanding of their experimental performance because the way we test this system is not suitable to capture the real dynamics of these systems. And then the inability to develop um, machine learning and uh, our smart systems, smart methodology to monitor the performance of this system in real time. So from these challenges comes out uh, interdisciplinary challenge that we took in uh, by laying down our main objectives that are, can be summarized in these three points. First, develop a reliable physical representation of what is happening inside and to drive the development of new technologies and then develop a testing and rating uh, methodologies that could uh, 
define new policies to drive the market towards more efficient products, and finally, inter developing intermediate real-time monitoring and control strategies. So that's what we're doing here at Waseda, so uh, developing a, a theory based on non-equilibrium thermodynamics for the physics of these systems, a new testing methodology that are able to capture the actual performance of this system when driven dynamically according to their control method, and some a machine learning um, related monitoring technique that could be easily applied to a large number of systems and could also provide a feedback, a real-time uh, signal of their performance that can be used for self-learning control method to make sure that they're always operating with their maximum efficiency. So if I could summarize the two things I have to say in this regard is that definitely what we are doing, uh, the interdisciplinary work that we're doing here at WIAS and uh, at Waseda is critical for achieving the targets that we are giving ourselves in this uh, decarbonization process. And for my specific field, uh, it is critical for making sure that this technology, heat pump, will play the role of one of the main solutions rather than one of the main obstacles towards uh, realizing a sustainable society. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, for presentation. So please prepare, prepare Jiu Sensei for the next presentation, uh, sharing the, uh, the screen on the web Zoom. Uh, thank you, Jan Janet Sensei. It is very inspiring for me that, uh, you know, even for the, such a, you know, uh, well-established technology like heat pump, it is very difficult to uh, estimate the efficiency in the real actual environment. Uh, yeah. I think it is a good good room for the increase. Definitely, uh, it's, it's yeah, an opportunity. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Then, okay. Then, please go ahead, uh, Ju Sensei, for your uh, opening talk. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Ji Yi, and this is my second year in WIAS. And my topic, to, the thing I want to share today, is the demand side and supply side solutions towards. Uh, towards carbon neutrality, uh, which also Ali Mula Sensei has uh, mentioned this uh, in the keynote speech. Um, uh, how, how, how we understand this carbon neutrality, I would say I would understand it as a, a long-term goal to uh, achieve uh, net zero CO2 emissions, and this is actually a goal of climate policies. Um, or and this climate policy goal is slightly different from energy policies or environmental policies. But if we are talking about all the greenhouse gases that are generated from uh, human being activities, and we need to touch this largest part, the CO2 emissions from. Uh, burning fossil fuel energy carriers and which will lead us back to the energy issues we are talking in this panel. And human beings have been uh, mitigating CO2 emissions and have been adapting to the climate changes for decades and uh, the understanding, human beings' understanding of climate change has also been improving. So many experts, experts from so, so many disciplines, uh, for example here experts who study sea level rises, uh, heat waves uh, and uh, energy and use technologies, uh, for example the heat pump technologies uh, Nicro had just introduced. Uh, people, ex experts from so many disciplines can contribute to uh, the increase, uh, the rise of understanding, uh, a better understanding of the solutions to the rising level of G uh, greenhouse gases. And uh, uh, this will also include, the, for example, the emission rebounds due to the social behaviors. So that will be the experts from natural science and social science from many disciplines. And the, here is a classification from IPCC, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, they would uh, uh, clarify it as first we see Working Group 1. Working Group 1 provides physical science examination. And Working Group 2 works on how human beings can adapt to uh, adapt to the climate change. And working groups three, how to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And this working group three 
is highly interdisciplinary. It covers, uh, for example, the feasibility of energy technologies, the costs, and the synergies and trade-offs with adaption measures with the working group too. And the most important part is the assessment of mitigation measures, including uh, policy instruments, government's options, and also social acceptabilities. And among which, uh, among which uh, we have, uh, there are demand side and supply side solutions. And uh, we, uh, in, this, in this time of uncertainty, we would expect a scenario uh, where uh, um, high levels of inclusive well-being and human development can be achieved, but with low levels of energy resources, energy uses and resource uses. Uh, we, we call it high with low scenario. And the pathway towards it uh, can be reviewed by, this, uh, by the models we call energy system models, and this is the models I, uh, and our, working, uh, our research lab uh, works on. And I will generally, uh, I will briefly introduce what these energy system models do. And this is our work and some key outputs. And these key outputs can, can include, for example, to achieve a specific national climate goal uh, in the case of Japan, which is to achieve net zero emission by 20, uh, 2050. And uh, what would the unit cost of electricity be, uh, the share of renewables in the power generation mix, the electrification rate, and all these ribbons here shows the, the, the possible, the, range of or feasible pathways. And one which I specifically focus on the energy and use technologies in industries. And the industries is kind of, um, uh, I would say in, by, by nature, it is hard to abate. For example, um, uh, the, inc the demand for uh, during this transition, energy transition or decarbonization transition, the demand for those materials and industry final products or intermediate uh, products, those demands would just not simply decline. And also there are national strategies to, to, to somehow keep those uh, industries to, develop, to make sure the, uh, the, the, the stable development of those industries. And also it takes time to uh, sh uh, shift from one technology to another. Uh, a blood furnace may be operating uh, over 40 or even 50 years. It takes time, and all these, uh, all, all these things by by nature that makes industry sector a very di a, a sector very difficult to abate. And this is this is true. This is also true in Japan. Um, uh, this is a figure showing the share of uh, final energy, and we can see that the, the, the most darkest part, uh, the, the, the share of industrial energy consumption, this in Japan, the share of it is actually quite high. Uh, it is, uh, compared to G7, it is actually closer to G20, and uh, which means uh, in, in Japan, uh, unlike, uh, for example, our 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 just uh, uh, common sense. For example, uh, developed developed countries may have a higher share of energy consumption in the transportation sectors, more vehicles. Uh, this is not the case here in Japan, and probably Dr. Motha will talk it uh, talk about the industrial decarbonization in Japan a little bit more later. And uh, um, I would say this is also probably the context or one reason we can hear the voice of invisibility from the industry stakeholders in Japan regarding the achievement of Japan's 2050 carbon neutral goal. And this is a survey uh, conducted last year uh, covering uh, 20,000 companies and in the sectors of construction, metal, uh, manufacturing, uh, plastics, and the like. And we can see that the yellow uh, part here, uh, this part here, it says that uh, uh, overall, including the, um, uh, so, sorry, it is the light blue part here, 19.9 .9 of the company respondents said that uh, they think it is impossible to achieve the carbon neutrality by 2050. And uh, not only the industrial stakeholders, uh, this, uh, we, 
uh, in our recent work with Doctex, all these uh, uh, technologies or low carbon technology, energy and use technologies in the industry, and compared to EU or global reports, both stakeholders, industry stakeholders and modelers in Japan show less interests in the low readiness level energy demand technologies. But it can be those low readiness level energy demand technologies that have a higher, a quite high potential to mitigate. So our work as researchers, uh, we would need to model them first, right? And I will finally give an example. This is one example of uh, low carbon cement. Uh, it locks or CCOM it absorbs uh, CO2 in its carbonation uh, process. Uh, we estimate the mitigation potential of uh, intense use of those materials. And there are, so a lot, there are actually a lot of similar projects in Japan, a lot of projects just Nicola just introduced, and uh, stock taking them, modeling them, and then review their role in a macro framework uh, is very important, and this will require inter um, disciplinary research collaboration. Uh, this is just uh, like tackling energy or climate issues. It requires the collaboration of different actors. And uh, that's all for my side. And thank you for your attention. Hi, thank you very much for Jui Sensei for your presentation. So please prepare the Morris Sensei for the next presentation. Uh, it is very inspiring for me, for the Juju Ju Sensei's presentation, that, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, contra in contrary to the, you know, common assumption that Japan is advanced in reducing energy or something like that, but, you know, there are, you know, we have to think about, uh, you, know, you know, the best strategy based on the, you know, industrial specificity. Yeah? And uh, I think that is a, there is a lot of room for the increase in the, you know, by, by, by you know, taking care for the low ladies level sector. Thank you. And then, uh, please go ahead, uh, Morris Sensei, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, my name is James Morris, and I'm uh, in my first year here at YAS. Um, first, I'd like to say I'm very thankful to Adimura Sensei for introducing um, the potential of using historical perspectives. Um, in carbon neutrality research because that's what I'm going to be um, doing today. So we're looking at the electrification of the Ashio copper mines. <clears throat> the Ashio copper mines were acquired by Furukawa Ichibe and his company Furukawa Honten on December 30th, 1876. Under Furukawa's management, the mines were wrested from the hands of insolvency and transformed into one of Japan's most product productive copper mining facilities. Um, with the company producing between 24% and 52.2% uh, of Japan's copper, which was uh, Japan's third largest import, uh, export at the time, uh, between 1883 and 1907. This transformation uh, was grounded in investment, the discovery of new deposits, technological innovation and labor reform. Um, indeed, such was the level of technological advancement in Ashio that the town became in the words of F.G. Notefler, uh, quote, one of the most technologically advanced centers in the country. In today's paper, I will explore the topic of energy um, by turning to the early history of Ashio copper mines electrification. The electrification of Ashio points to the complicated linkages between energy, productivity, profit, and pollution. I will describe the history <coughs> and origins of the mine's electrification and its implications. Uh, ventilation and flooding were uh, issues that affected all mines in Japan during the early Meiji period. David G. Whitner uh, writes that, quote, although there were sophisticated pumps available, most mines were drained by buckets, simple bamboo hand pumps, or abandoned. Similarly, miners benefited little from advances in ventilation. At best, miners could expect to see a wheel-driven fan at the entrance to the mine, end quote. These issues were particularly prominent at Ashio. Indeed, even though a large deposit was discovered in mid-1881 uh, in the Takanosu pit, thanks in part to labor reforms, production actually dropped due to continued ventilation and flooding issues that made mining the newly discovered ore difficult. 
Although this discovery spurred efforts that would lead to the uncovering of an even larger deposit in 1883, the resolution of the ventilation and flooding issues were inextricably linked to the mine's productivity or lack thereof. Um, so we see then in the early 1880s um, huge efforts to reduce these issues of flooding and ventilation, um, including the introduction of pumps, um, various um, uh, creation of ventilation shafts, uh, the introduction of blowers and um, uh, other technology to try and increase ventilation and reduce the effects of flooding. Um, but these innovations didn't really um, solve the issue deeper into the, to, to the mines. It was the electrification of the mines that uh, allowed these issues to be resolved. In 1886, uh, Furukawa engaged Wilhelm Heiss and Otto uh, Henberg of the German company Siemens uh, to explore the possibilities of introducing electricity into the mines, partially as a way to reduce uh, reliance on steam power, uh, which was requ requiring a large amount of firewood. Uh, so some of the um, uh, attempts to, so blowers, for example, were run on steam power and pumps were also increasingly run on steam power. Um, so this was an effort to reduce um, that problem. Um, these two men visited Ashio and provided initial recommendations, and then the following year, Siemens dispatched uh, Hermann Kessler uh, to Ashio to conduct a field survey for the plan. The same year, uh, a, a steam-powered power station was completed, and this was used to provide electricity within the blasting process at Ashio, but it didn't lead to the large-scale electrification of the mines. In January 1889, Furukawa approved Siemens' plan for the electrification of the mines, leading to the construction um, with Siemens of the Mato hydroelectric power plant, which the remains of which are pictured here. Not much to look at nowadays. Um, which was completed uh, after a year and three months of construction in December 1890. And this represents the first use of hydroelectric power in mining in Japan and the second use of hydroelectric power in the country. The power station was capable of producing uh, 600 horsepower, and it was used for operating pumps, uh, automating uh, shaft hoisting, uh, lighting in the mines, and a telephone system within the mines. Uh, this effectively allowed all excess water to be pumped out of the mines using um, an electric pressure pump, and um, further improvements to the this um, electricity production system um, allowed for drilling also to be electrified, so electric drilling could be used. The Mato um, hydroelectric power plant did not result in the complete electrification of the mines. Um, however, due to the sustainability of this power source and the ability to radically reduce the use of firewood, Furukawa rapidly expanded the use of hydroelectricity, opening new power plants in Tsudo, which uh, is the location of another shaft, and three hydroelectric power plants in Kodaki, which was, again, the location of another series of shafts, allowing the whole mine system, including its ventilation, um, water pumping, ore dressing and smelting works, to be electrified by the mid-1890s. To give an idea of what this meant, uh, in 1892, um, hydroelectricity supplied 1,120 horsepower of the uh, 1,600 horsepower that the mines needed. Um, if this had been ran on steam power instead, this would require around eight kilograms of firewood per day, uh, costing um, about 22,000 yen per annum. Um, the electrification of the mines appears to have had, alongside other um, factors, a, a huge influence on production. Uh, with the exception of 1895, when Ashio's production was at 4,898 tons, that you can see here, um, the mine did not produce less than 5,000 tons per annum between 1890 and 1900, uh, so after the electrification began, um, and did not produce less than 6,000 tons per annum uh, between 1900 and 1907. Alongside other innovations, the collective sum of Ashio's technological advancements meant that it was capable of producing 
um, about twice as much as its nearest competitor, um, Sumitomo, uh, Sumitomo's Beshi mine, uh, with only 66% of um, Beshi's labor force. Thus, um, we can list some positive influences of the electrification of the mines. It provided a sustainable power source, reducing the need for firewood and cutting associated costs. It allowed the mines to finally resolve the issues of ventilation and flooding, which had created issues with productivity and profitability since the mid-17th century. Um, and it allowed new innovations to be made. Alongside other innovations and reforms, this led to large increases in production and profitability. Nevertheless, benefits are only one side of the story. Water pumped from the mines was not treated, um, so pollutants entering the Watarase River um, actually increased following the elect electrification of the mines. And this would lead to the contamination of over 46,000 uh, 46, hectares um, of land with polluted water, costing around 23 million yen worth of damage across Tochigi, Gunma, Ibaraki, Saitama, Chiba, and Tokyo in 1896 alone. And this was a, a yearly issue. And uh, this seriously exacerbated then um, the Ashio copper mine incident, uh, which the mines are famous for, the, the first uh, major modern pollution event in Japanese history. To close then, we are therefore met with something which may seem somewhat oxymoronic for modern listeners. And the role of a sustainable power source, uh, hydroelectricity, in increasing the severity of environmental disaster. As a final reflection, I would like to suggest that the electrification of Ashio copper mines shows two interesting points. First, the use of sustainable electricity production to increase productivity and profit. I find this interesting since, uh, on a popular level at least, uh, we oftentimes view sustainable forms of energy as part of a trade-off, increased environmental protection for reduced profits, uh, potentially, uh, on a popular level again, I, maybe not as academics. But Ashio confirms that the opposite is possible. Second, uh, the potential role of sustainable power as a contributing factor to pollution. Again, on, on the popular level, we often find moralistic narratives attached to energy production. We may say nuclear energy is bad or fossil fuels are bad and sustainable energy is good, etc. So we have this, this moral attachment to our, our types of energy production. But perhaps Ashio shows us that the questions of who controls energy production or for what purpose energy production is, uh, or for what purpose energy is produced are equally important. We can develop production-driven and profit-driven sustainable energy, but perhaps this comes with additional costs. And thank you very much. Hi. Thank you very much, Mori Sensei. Very, very interesting presentation from the very special point of view from history. And uh, I understand that uh, the Ashio Dozan is, a, is not, uh, you know, not only a historical fact, but it is you know, showing at the future of our society. Uh, it, is kind of, it is a sort of hindsight to look back to what, what is the reason for the innovation, what is the effect of the innovation or something like that. But we have to think about the future foresight to how we could make the future in the energy you know, uh, efficient society. And it is a good starting point for the, the, the further uh, conversation. Thank you very much. And then, please go ahead, Monta Sensei, for your presentation. Thank you very much. So I'm Alin Morta. I believe I'm the only one. I'm the only speaker here who's not from YS. So I would like to be uh, to say that I'm very grateful for being invited here today. I'm a PhD candidate at the Graduate School of Economics in Waseda University. So I will give a bit more of an economist perspective in addition to Professor Ali Murat. So my topic of research is energy consumption in the manufacturing sector under an electricity tax in Japan. So first of all, some of you might be wondering why we need to talk about the, manuf the manufacturing sector at all. The reason is because, first of all, I mean, most of the country's emissions are coming from the power sector, sure, but then the second in line is the industry. And if we consider the indirect emissions, 
um, then the Japanese industry is the number one uh, emitter here because the Japanese industry is also the largest electricity consumer. So all of these, if we consider the emission directly from the industry and the emissions that they indirectly emit from consuming this electricity, then we have roughly 40%, sorry, we have uh, the largest emitter here. And this is becoming a problem. And actually, I mean, it's starting to become a public talk, a public subject of discussion. So you can see here on the left-hand side, the Japanese material makers are making the move to cut their CO2 emissions. And this is a uh, headline from the Japan Times in June 2022. So this is a very recent topic. So, I mean, unlike what Professor Morris discussed here, I mean, one of the options for uh, Japanese material makers to decarbonize is to electrify the production line. So, electrification is the way, but at the same time, we still we will still have an amount of fuel consumption that will remain due to uh, material consumption. So, so, I mean, for their material production line. So in this, uh, in my research, I mostly focus on the chemical and petrochemical industry, the iron and steel industry, and the paper and pulp industry, because altogether, these three industries represent 70% of the fossil fuel consumption for material production. Now, at the same time, the ma manufacturers in Japan understand very well that they need to electrify, but they are receiving a little bit of uh, let's say, mixed signals from the Japanese government. On one hand, we have a very ambitious commitment for carbon neutrality by 2050, which has been renewed by former Prime Minister Suga in 2020. And this image here, this figure, actually shows how much the industry is going to have to reduce their energy consumption by 2030 and then become actually carbon neutral by 2050. So that's one incentive for electrification. But at the end, we also have several policies that encourage these manufacturers to reduce their fossil fuel consumption, one of which is the national carbon tax that was introduced in 2012, although, I mean, its rate is rather low at the moment, and also the regional ETS that have been introduced in Tokyo and Saitama prefectures. In addition to these very direct carbon pricing policies, we also have a lot of energy efficiency program, um, especially following uh, the uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster in 2011. And more recently, we also have some voluntary action from the industry in the form of the GX League. Now, all of these are incentives for electrification, but at the same time, there are some barriers to the electrification. I would say the biggest one is probably the price of electricity in Japan. Now, if you look at this figure, you can see that Japan, in comparison with other developed nations, is paying its electricity extremely high, especially for the uh, industries. So we have very high electricity prices, and actually they have been increasing in the, I mean, following the uh, uh, 2011 incident. That's one reason, but also we have had the introduction of the feed-in tariff levy, which is akin to an electricity tax in 2012, which makes it even more expensive. In addition to this, yes, we do have carbon pricing in Japan, but at the same time, these are very low carbon tax rates. Some people have been mentioning that they are not high enough to actually efficiently incentivize the industry to electrify. And yes, we do also have regional ETS, but first of all, they're regional, so they, are, they do not apply to the entirety of the country. And one of them, the one in Saitama, where the majority of the target is the manufacturing industry, is still rather voluntary. There is no uh, penalty for non-compliers. Another, I mean, I wouldn't say it's an obstacle for electrification, but it's more of a I would, I would say food for thought, is because most of the electricity in Japan is still made from fossil fuel. So, I mean, if you electrify, but the electricity that you buy is still made by burning fossil fuel, then, you know, what is the point of electrification in the first place? And finally, after 2011, the industry has been a little scared, I'd say, um, because, of the because of an unreliable electricity supply and a grid instability you have, you still have rolling blackouts, very much planned in advance. But we also have a bit of an increased share in intermittent renewable energy, which leads to, I mean, uh, sometimes some uh, demand, I mean, some request from the Japanese government to reduce electricity demand, for instance, I think last summer in Japan. So, based on these considerations, 
Uh, my research focuses on the impact of this electricity tax, which was introduced in 2012 in Japan, and its impact on energy consumption among these three uh, top fossil fuel uh, consumers. So the iron and steel, chemical, and pulp and paper. So these three graphs are showing you the results of this research and how um, the resulting CO2 emissions because of the introduction of this electricity tax. So the first thing that is quite striking from this figure is in the first few years after the introduction so of this electricity tax of in 2012, 13, 14, I mean, the majority of these uh, um, industrial sectors are actually increasing their fossil fuel consumption because of the tax. At the same time, you see, if you really look closely at these figures, you can see that the electricity consumption is reduced, but when you, con when you convert this electricity consumption into CO2 emissions, it's basically uh, a drop in the ocean. So, I mean, this overall, the electricity tax, what we can say is that it encouraged fossil fuel consumption and actually increased CO2 emission, which is the opposite of what we want, right? So some of you might be wondering, well, why is it happening? Like, why, is it why is fossil fuel consumption reacting con to an electricity tax at all, actually? So when we actually looked at the structure of this fossil fuel consumption, we decomposed it into two elements, the first one being fossil fuel consumption for material, which are uh, what Ju Sensei was talking about, hard to abate emissions, and the fossil fuel consumption to power and create um, make generate um, electricity on site. And so actually, I mean, as intuitively, uh, it's, we actually show that the material consumption, the fossil fuel for material production is not actually um, affected by this electricity tax at all. However, this rebound in fossil fuel consumption is actually driven by the fossil fuel consumption to power electricity, to make electricity for themselves. So this research is actually showing that when you introduce an electricity tax, you have very much uh, unplanned uh, effects, one of which is that you encourage fossil fuel consumption to replace electricity purchased with electricity generated on site. So a big takeaway from this is that, I mean, of course we can use models to simulate how policies are gonna affect um, the industrial sector, but at the same time we should keep in mind that even with the best models, we cannot you know, predict everything and you might have some, some kind of effects that are absolutely not planned and um, which call for, well, a better types of policies, so perhaps not an electricity tax. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monta-san. Uh, uh, it is very inspiring. Inspiring that uh, as, uh, as in, in the end of your presentation, you mentioned that uh, regulation and the rule change needs, uh, you know, a lot of the, you know attention because uh, their uh, reaction on the you know consumer consumption side is so complex that you know the potent the the, the will the intention of the policy maker do not you know directly affect their uh, uh, the, the behavior. So we need a sort of the behavioral insights in order to actually change the reaction of the, the stakeholders. Thank you. So as we uh, show all the you know presentation, it is very inspiring that there are so many different people, so many uh, the energy issue is tackled in from the very different uh, viewpoint, very different disciplines. So. For the remaining time, so let me see. So we do, we have uh, several, uh, you know, 10, uh, 15 minutes of for the general discussion. So then we have we'd like to uh, discuss together how we could uh, uh, do for the, the to resolve the energy issues, possibly by the collaboration. From the different uh, discipline, like uh, you know, uh, in the case in the situation of the wires, and for these presenters, and also we have to think about not only from the academic side, but also we have to think about the collaboration with the other stakeholders, including the policymakers, or industry, or citizen, 
layman or sort of thing. So uh, please, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, response to my question: What is your next step in order to cope with uh, energy issues uh, from each of the participants, presenters? So please go ahead, uh, Janetti san. Hi. Okay, so maybe what I would like to open this uh, free discussion with is a comment and an answer to your question. So, <clears throat> so as engineers, we, we uh, believe a technology is directed to influence society and somehow to change and make it better, obviously. But um, most of the time, also listening to the other presenters' uh, uh, point of view and uh, uh, experience. It, it is actually the society affecting the technology and um, meaning that this technology would have very different usage, very different efficiency, very different uh, usefulness or troubles depending on the way it is used, the historical time it is used in, the level of diffusion and profitability it has. And uh, it was yeah very mind broadening for an engineer who sometimes is a little bit too focused on a specific task uh, to see from uh, uh, use and say how important it is to have models um, from Arimura sensei and, and Morta sensei how important are data for making the user aware of the, the technology they're using, the, the way they're using it and how from Mori sensei how a technology may become obsolete uh, or revive in a different uh, form in different historical times. And yeah, again, from more than how difficult it is to actually affect industry, uh, even with new technological uh, advancement, uh, with new policies, etc. cetera. So uh, yeah, it was very mind broadening. And, I think that that is the direction it uh, should go to. So as obviously uh, this is one of the purpose of this discussion to have uh, awareness between different uh, stakeholders, between different researchers, between different uh, viewpoints. So yes, uh, this should be done obviously in cooperation between this field. And uh, first I would say that uh, yeah, on the engineering side, we are lacking to provide what we should have. So a clear, um, a clear knowledge, a clear uh, answer to the question on, for example, how much we could save in terms of uh, emission and how a technology should be used or how we can uh, control this technology. Obviously, if the technology gets more difficult to uh, control more smart and sometimes the user gets no clue on how to use it so it is not an easy process but uh, I would like to yeah uh, keep on uh, working on that uh, on clarifying and providing those data those models those um, uh, things that we as engineer we can provide but while as the, at the same time looking at uh, the viewpoints of other stakeholders. So that was, yeah, very, very important for me. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I I think that. Uh, thank you for summarizing the, all the other you know participants' presentation in your own in your own way. And I think that uh, from my view that I'm also a, you know policy scientist and also uh, working on the material science as well. So you know in the in the science that I'm uh, I'm on your side and also I'm on your side as well. And I think that from the uh, from the point of view of engineering, so we have to think about the, you know how the market or how the policy or you know the the other outer side of the engineering is behaving. Mm -hmm. It's very important. So, to, because so, so that we have to think about the technology, not only about the technology, but also the society and especially for the policy and also the whole system. Yeah? So I think this is a great, good, good, good starting point for us to you know. Co to further co co uh, co communication on these issues. Yes, definitely. And mm. uh, if I had a little bit more time, I would have maybe introduced uh, oh. how mm. uh, these systems are 
tested. Mm. Ah, so testing. Mm. They are tested in a way that is not representative mm. of what is happening in reality. So ah, I see. Mm. So we have wrong numbers. Ah, the, yeah. The you, mention, you are mentioning the digital twins, right? Yes. yes, yes. So we need a kind of digital twin of the whole system, whole universe, in order to you know estimate the, you know, the carbon and the sustainability. Thank you. And uh, so please go ahead for the Ju, Ju Sensei. How about you? So yeah, yeah, what thanks. is the next uh, next you know action? Yeah, I just want to add one thing. I saw the figure. Mm. I think it's the second page or something from from your slides and mm. showing 1.2 gigaton of CO2. And I saw their results. I just want to point out that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting to see. Uh, okay, uh, time is limited. I, I want to let, let's stick to the questions or what actions should be uh, taken in the future to solve the energy related problem. This is a very large question, and we and um, I'm not sure if I have time to introduce it all. But we are actually doing a survey asking this uh, asking these questions to. Um, order experts uh, in this field, uh, not, not, not specifically in this field, but somehow they have this expertise in the climate change. We interviewed 109 uh, experts in Japan and we asked them those questions. And these experts are from industries, are from academia, are from uh, civil uh, society, or from the government. And they are back. They are, they are their discipline can be social science and can be uh, natural science. And we are asking them this question. And uh, uh, every every experts uh, sometimes they know too much and they talk a lot, and sometimes it makes the 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 the, the output very complicated. But one thing I want to say that it, there is no um, silver bullet solution. There is no one solution that can solve everything. For example, we could not uh, expect uh, we we have DAX. We have anyway. In one day, we will have uh, those technologies that directly remove CO2 from the atmosphere and with very low cost, always affordable cost, there is no silver bullet um, solutions and we need to work on this together. Uh, then it, this uh, would need efforts from all different stakeholders and all front different actors. And this is my, um, uh, my preliminary uh, message uh, through this, 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 this uh, large scale interview. And also um, um, for, for the uh, for presentation today, um, I'm quite surprised. Uh, I'm, I'm very uh, impressed by the, um, what Morrison's uh, introduced. Uh, the, this 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 mine powered by hydropower, uh, like almost 200 years ago. I think this is very similar. Uh, several decades ago, no one would expect PV solar power can be this cheap, right? And I think this is very very interesting. And also the on-site generation, and from the energy energy uh, perspective, uh, this is good. This is uh, this will somehow make uh, improve the energy, uh, the supply, uh, the secure supply mm -hmm. of energy, and pro probably from the climate um, perspective, mm -hmm. uh, the on-site generation still it generate mm -hmm. CO two, right? Mm -hmm. And it is hard to record, and overall, so yes, uh, I, I have a. Uh, this this is uh, how how people from different disciplines will mm. see the same question differently. Right, right, right. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing the result of the questionnaire survey. Yeah, very interesting. And so, please go ahead, uh, the Mori Sensei. How about your next action on the cool. for resolving the energy issues? Well, thank you very much, yeah. and uh, thank you uh, for all the papers. I don't think we have a great deal of time left, so. I will keep things uh, quite short. Um, so I was uh, sort of reflecting today on where the humanities stand within everything, because I, I'm often unsure myself where <laughs> I stand as a humanities scholar within the, amongst the hard sciences. Um, but people familiar with my research may know that uh, usually I focus on uh, religious responses to um, Asio's pollution and um, there's a thinker, uh, a Christian thinker called Uchimura Kanzo who is uh, a famous Japanese Christian thinker who uh, reflecting on Japan's uh, industrialization 
um, said that scientific advancement cannot be made without love for the truth. Now, I can't get into what he means by this statement in too much detail, but what he's effectively saying is that scientific advancement needs to go hand in hand with moral concern. And I think this um, focus on my ethics and perhaps focus on the human side of things is where the humanities can really speak to um, um, or, or enter dialogue with um, the harder sciences. Um, moving forward in my personal research, um, I have a few grant applications in place to work with computer scientists, so to create, um, a, attempting to create a, a large amount of machine readable data on the ASIO's pollution, and, um, and a grant application to work with um, people within other humanities disciplines, anthropologists, um, and uh, social scientists as well, to explore um, uh, the role of religion in pollution incident or religious responses to pollution incidents in Asian history. Um, but yes, that's everything. Sorry for taking up a bit of time. Apologies. Thank you very much. And please go ahead, uh, the Montasan. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank all the speakers today because all of their presentations were very, very nice, very enlightening. I uh, especially liked uh, your presentation, Mori Sensei, about the dangers of electrification, <laughs> I guess. But um, in, I'll keep it very, very short. But I think that, yes, more, a further academic collaboration uh, could be very nice to kind of uh, broaden our perspective and see more topics. But I also think that some outreach activities uh, to the public and try to explain these policies in the simplest term possible to have more people um, on our side. So for instance, if we consider the industry, there's still a lot of opposition to carbon pricing nowadays. But if we consider the alternative, I mean, as my presentation showed, they're not exactly ideal either. So I think that outreach activities uh, would be a next step for us. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for everyone for response, for, for response to my question. And uh, I think that uh, it, we, we, you, all of you have a lot of, to, to talk about in these issues, but due to the limitation of time, so this is uh, at the end of this session. But uh, this is just a starting point for discussing the how to resolve the energy issues uh, started at Waseda University. Advanced Institute, the Advanced Institute was, 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 was wires, and uh, I think that wires is a good place for uh, discussing such uh, uh, thanks to the very interdisciplinary environment. And I think Waseda University works as a, as a platform to open up the collaboration with different stakeholders. So please enjoy your environment at wires. Uh, to enlarge your uh, interest and uh, uh, collaboration with other stakeholders. So thank you very much for all the, uh, the presenters for joining this session.